everyone. Uh, today's lecture is about text classification. Um, and so oftentimes um, we're interested in classifying text um, for its topic, uh, maybe for its sentiment, uh, classifying the type of text. And so if there is a suitable training data set, training a neural topic classifier is very straightforward. And so essentially we'd find ourselves in the context of B on the below graph. Um, and um, so we simply put a classifier head um, on the class token of a transformer encoder language model and tune the model. Um, there's a variety of code bases for being able to do this. Um, and so if you find yourself in the situation where you have a suitable uh, labeled data set uh, for training a classifier for topic classification for sentiment classification, then you're in a good position and it will be relatively straightforward. Um, but oftentimes the challenge of this task comes in terms of having that suitable labeled data set um, because uh, classification is a supervised task. So there's a large literature in economics that essentially performs text topic classification. Um, and this is overwhelmingly done using keyword search. And so for example, there's an entire review article on historical newspaper data with the overwhelming majority of papers reviewed uh, quantifying text with keyword searches. And so what are the potential problems with keyword search? Um, well, centrally, keyword search is a sparse method. It cannot capture semantic similarity by definition because it's a sparse method. And um, as we you know, talked about over and over again in this class, the semantics of language are complex. Um, and so at a minimum, you know, this could lead to poor recall, even if precision of a keyword method is quite high. Of course, OCR noise might also lower recall. And kind of importantly, there's a large literature in linguistics about how semantics can be correlated with things like geography. Um, people uh, across uh, space speak differently. Uh, time, language changes over time, ethnic composition, um, social class, etc. And so essentially the way that uh, people speak, the way the text is written is correlated with a lot of other stuff. Um, and there you know, could easily be context where that other stuff enters the air term, um, which is then going to bias downstream analyses if that's the case. Um, moreover, keywords tend to be much less accurate than neural methods, and there's a literature showing that the choice of keywords can influence output. Um, and so if you have kind of you're in a situation where you're using something that's not very accurate to start with, um, and where you have a lot of researcher degrees of freedom, um, that also really opens the door for manipulation because you're choosing things and those things might make a big difference because um, you, know, you only have 50% accuracy to start with. Whereas if you have a method that's already 98% you know, accurate at base and then you can kind of make some changes to that, there's just less scope um, even if someone is nefarious for there to be manipulation. Um, so one could mine keywords on labeled data. Um, and so in short, you know, you, you label some data and then you use that to directly mine keywords. Um, but if you want to use combinations of keywords, which is very, very common, this very quickly becomes computationally intractable because when you take combinations of things just very quickly, you get an intractable number of combinations that you need to examine. Um, you know, some people suggested to us that um, we could use uh, GPT <laughs> to find keywords, and maybe this would solve some of the problems with keywords. Um, unfortunately, it, it didn't work that well. Um, you know, so um, for example, uh, we asked GPT um, to look for, to, to suggest keywords for finding newspaper articles written in 1916 about the war in Europe. Um, and the first thing GPT tells us is World War I. It's like, no, we're looking for um, articles written in 1916 about the war. I don't think World War I is going to pull up anything, right? Um, and so just to say, I don't think GPT is going to magically solve um, whatever problems exist with keywords either. Um, and so I just wanted to give uh, some examples. Um, 
And um, so this is a paper that looks systematically at keywords. It's not doing this in the topic in the context of topic classification, but rather um, in the context of looking at what sorts of words are used in context of other words. Um, but I thought it was just an interesting example because it was a very thorough meta-analysis of uh, the literature um, using word embeddings to um, measure um, to measure bias. Um, and so this is just an example of seeds they use for different concepts like unpleasant, uh, African-American, domestic work, ugliness, etc. So they have these different concepts and then they conceptualize those with specific keywords. Um, and the literature is kind of all over the place um, in terms of how keywords are defined. Um, so I haven't done something similar for the economics literature, um, but I suspect that it would sort of, you know, kind of look all over the place as well. Some people get their keywords from the corpus, you know, they look at it and they see what makes sense um, is most common. They might mine keywords less commonly. They might just reuse what another paper uses, uh, borrowed from social sciences. So like, you know, psychologists have derived a list of words that, you know, um, they say are associated with some concept and people use that. Um, crowdsourced, population derived, which are things they got from the census. Um, so, you know, looking at occupations and you use occupation lists from the census, etc. So essentially like, when you're choosing keywords, it can really be all over the place and there is no standard in the literature um, for how you're supposed to choose keywords. Um, and so it's one of those things that oftentimes just isn't even really that discussed at all. Um, and so this is a paper um, called Bad Seeds and it's looking at keywords in the context of word embeddings. Um, but here they're using the same um, unpleasantness vector. So unpleasantness was like, um, you know, something like you see up here. Um, and they're looking at how much unpleasantness is associated with uh, women in romance literature versus in history and biography. And they see that just kind of like, they show here that just, you know, relatively kind of um, maybe modest differences in how you um, define the keywords associated with women can lead to really big differences in the conclusions you draw about whether, say, you know, romance is more sexist than history and biography. Um, and, you know, so again, kind of just um, goes to, to show that if you're using keywords to define something, you know, the semantics of that thing may be really rich and um, it can be kind of correlated with the air term um, in ways that can be hard to anticipate. Um, so if the problem is, you know, mostly that um, sparse methods like keywords can't capture semantic similarity, uh, what can capture semantic similarity? Of course, that's the real power of neural methods. That's what's really allowed large language models to take off. Um, neural methods also just tend to be a lot more accurate, um, so plausibly less scope for manipulation. However, of course, neural methods are not guaranteed to produce a less biased classification than keyword methods. Uh, neural classification methods are trained on label data, and so if there's problems with your label data set, they're going to inherit um, whatever biases are present in your labels. Um, and so more specifically, when we create a labeled sample for training a neural classifier, um, we would like the labeled data to be drawn from the same distribution as the unlabeled data. And if this is not the case, it will affect the performance on the unlabeled data at inference time, you'll get worse performance, and it will potentially introduce biases that could be correlated with downstream, downstream outcomes. You know, if whatever makes your labeled data different from your unlabeled data is also going to enter your error term um, when you look at downstream outcomes. And so the gold standard approach to labeling is to simply take a random sample. However, the model needs to be exposed to a roughly equal number of labels across classes in training. And if the underlying data are very unbalanced, it would be extremely inefficient and quickly become totally unfeasible to construct a relatively balanced uh, training sample through random sampling. It's just not practical. You know, there might be one in a thousand positives for what you're looking for or even less. 
Um, and so this is where active learning plausibly comes in. So active learning uses either model uncertainty or features of the data itself to select samples for annotation. Um, active learning need not lead the labeled data to be drawn from the same distribution as the unlabeled data, but there are methods that have this objective. Okay, so I wanna give just a brief uh, bit of background. Um, and so there's a literature um, on domain adaptation, um, which actually predates um, the literature on deep learning. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about it. I believe a NeurIPS paper from 2010. Um, I know we saw a few older papers in this class like Lynette um, or um, LSTM, but this is like um, one of the oldest papers that, that, that we've seen. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and so domain adaptation aims to bound the error of a binary classifier trained on a source distribution, which we'll call DS, but evaluated on a target distribution that we'll call DT. Um, so to measure how diff, you know, in order to be able to bound this, they need to be able to measure how different they are. And the point of this paper is that they're gonna show this bound uh, depends on the difference between these two distributions. You know, so the more out of sample um, you are, uh, the larger this, this bound is gonna be. Um, and so they need to measure the difference between the two distributions and they use something called H divergence. Um, and so the basic idea behind H divergence is that we have a data set um, and um, we have two distributions over that data set, the source distribution, um, so like your labels and the target distribution. And let H be uh, what they call a hypothesis class over X which is just a set of the possible classifiers that you could have. Um, and then we define H divergence um, using um, a measure uh, that finds kind of the best classifier for distinguishing um, a DS from DT, um, and then looks at how much S can be distinguished from T with that best classifier. Um, and so you can approximate H divergence by training a linear classifier to, to discriminate between unlabeled instances from the source and the target domains. Um, so why do they do this? Well, in distribution-free settings, common measures of divergence like L1 or Kolbeck labeler divergence cannot be estimated from finite samples. Um, so, but it is sufficient to use a classifier-induced divergence, um, H divergence, um, with the estimates of H divergence converging to true H divergence and finite samples. Um, and so this idea was applied to active learning in 2019. Um, and so let's assume uh, that the unlabeled pool of data is large enough to represent the true distribution. Um, and um, so the basic motivation is that we could ask for each example that we could potentially label how certain it is that it came from the unlabeled versus the labeled set. And if the labeled set is representative of the unlabeled set, we won't be able to tell which set it came from. Alternatively, if we can conclude with high probability that an unlabeled example came from the unlabeled set, uh, this means it is different from the data that we've already labeled, um, and labeling it should be informative. Okay, so let's uh, talk about uh, what discriminative active learning does a bit more formally. So that's gonna be the intuition. We're, wanting, we're going to want to pull data to label next from our unlabeled set um, such that we're the most confident that that data came from the unlabeled set um, because it's gonna be more informative that way compared to what we've already labeled. Um, and so, um, Let's have some mapping function uh, psi that goes um, from x to x hat, um, where x is our original input space and x hat is some learned representation. Um, and so this is the representation learned to solve the original task using the labeled set. So think of this as the embedding space um, for the, um, the topic classification task. And we define a binary classification problem where x hat is the input space. And so the inputs are going to be our representations, not the raw data. And this tends to work better than using the raw data. 
so the inputs are the x hat and then um we also have the label space where l is the label for the sample bean and the labeled set and u is the label for the sample bean and the unlabeled set and for every iteration of the active learning process we solve the binary classification problem between the labeled an unlabeled class um, by minimizing the loss um, on that classifier um, and that's going to yield a classification model and we use that model to select the top k samples from it where we're most confident um, that those came from the unlabeled set given the classifier that's been trained um, and so this paper can show the discriminant of active learning, which I just described, is a proxy to minimizing H divergence in a greedy manner. So at each iteration, we approximately find the classifier um, that achieves the supremum of um, the H divergence. Um, and then we move an example from the unlabeled to the labeled set so as to decrease um, H divergence. Um, so discriminative active learning is also similar to generative adversarial networks, um, which I know we haven't talked about yet, so don't worry if you're not familiar, but some people are, so I'll say a word about this now. Um, so um, discriminative active learning attempts to fool a discriminator, which tries to distinguish between data coming from two different distributions, and so this is exactly what GANs do. Um, but there's an important difference here. You know, the distribution created by the generator in GANs is differentiable and changes according to the gradient of the discriminator. Whereas in the discriminative active learning setting, we can't uh, change the distribution of the labeled data in a differentiable way. Rather, we can only change the labeled distribution by transferring examples from the unlabeled distribution. So this is discrete and non-differentiable. Um, and in um, the active learning setting, we're training the discriminator until convergence, um, and this helps to avoid mode collapse. And so the problems you get with GANs being really convoluted to train um, doesn't arise in this setting, fortunately. <laughs> All right, um, you know, I'll also note that there's a relation to selection bias, and so the original domain adaptation, very briefly, uh, cites Heckman 1979, um, having labeled data that is not drawn from the same distribution as the unlabeled data is akin uh, to having selection bias um, and um, is, is going to influence your estimates. Okay, so I wanna talk about a couple of empirical papers on this. Um, so there's a paper called Active Learning for BERT, an empirical study. Uh, this paper has a code base uh, for implementing discriminative active learning. That code base does only work with BERT. Um, though, you know, we're working on kind of um, updating this code base um, and we'll release it um, eventually. Um, and so this paper focuses on binary classification with a small annotation budget, which kind of pretty much describes anything that we would do, and skewed data. Um, and so um, the number of positives is, is much uh, smaller than the number of negatives. Um, and the paper documents that discriminative active learning can boost BERT performance, especially in the most realistic scenario, they argue, in which the initial set of labeled examples is creating using keyword-based queries. Right, because you're still going to need an initial set of labels um, to train the model on. Um, and when you pulled out your initial set to label based on keywords, um, they argue that that tends to give very biased samples um, with keywords. Um, it's kind of very easy to tell um, what came um, from the labeled and unlabeled data. Um, and so when you use discriminative active learning as compared to other methods and start with keywords, um, you do better with discriminative active learning. So comparing to several active learning strategies, they find that discriminative active learning consistently performs best in terms of the diversity of the chosen mini batches and in terms of mini batches representing the overall data distribution. We also found a recent dissertation in political science on this topic. Um, and they compare keyword search, uh, which is conventional approach in the social sciences, um, 
with query expansion techniques, topic model-based classification rules, and active learning. And they find that active learning substantially outperforms keyword search as long as the label set is not too small, um, which they argue is about a thousand labeled documents. Um, your mileage may vary. Um, so how do we see discriminative active learning? Because we're going to need an initial labeled sample, right, to, to, to get the process started. Um, you could use keywords. Um, you could use retrieval. Um, so we've done a lot with DPR trained on a natural language inference to do zero-shot retrieval. You could do zero-shot classification. You would typically do that with a BART large classifier. Uh, you could find a small number of anchors randomly and take nearby content in like expert space. Um, and so short, in short, there's a lot of ways to seed the model. The idea is with discriminative active learning, it shouldn't matter. It may influence how quickly you kind of converge um, to, um, to a representative labeled sample. And this is something that we've been exploring recently, but I don't have um, any results on yet. OK, so I want to shift a bit to talking about sentiment. Um, and, which is essentially very akin to topic classification um, in that, you know, again, if you have suitable labeled data, it's very straightforward, uh, technically speaking, to conduct sentiment uh, analysis. Um, and so in this uh, picture, again, it's going to be panel B, where you put in the a text and you add um, a classifier to the class token. Um, and so overwhelmingly, when the deep learning literature talks about sentiment classification, their benchmarks uh, revolve around reviews and, you know, disproportionately things like movie reviews, restaurant reviews, and laptop reviews. Um, and so in the context of reviews, sentiment is often pretty clear to interpret, you know, and there's also an aspect-based sentiment literature for things like, you know, the food was great, but the service was terrible. Um, there's quite a large literature extending sentiment analysis to other domains that are probably of more interest to us um, than uh, movie and restaurant reviews, um, like political slant. Um, but a lot of the literature is, is not very good. It's not really fully clear that they mean something coherent by sentiment. Um, and analyses of this literature have found that this seems to be a really hard task, um, that accuracy tends to be quite low. Um, and so this is sentiment analysis uh, benchmark. So the first one's movie reviews, second one movie re reviews, third one movie reviews, Yelp uh, classification, um, binary and fine-grained. I'm not sure what MR is, but I guess from a la carte in the title of that paper, I'm guessing maybe it's also reviews, maybe restaurant reviews, um, Amazon reviews, Amazon reviews. You know, so this is from papers with codes. So you get the point. Like... Um, in deep learning, um, when people do sentiment analysis, um, you know, in the bulk of this literature, um, they're using reviews. So things like, you know, political issues are often really broad um, and inherently different from a movie or a laptop review, uh, which are essentially evaluating a fairly homogenous good. Like also, oftentimes in text, the sentiment can be implicit, whereas in a review, like the point is that you are being explicit about how you feel about the product. And learning implicit sentiment can be challenging and reasonable humans may disagree. Um, you know, so for example, you know, like, and you know, the, an another issue is that kind of sentiment analysis as it's done in the deep learning literature is typically positive, negative, positive, negative, neutral. Sometimes it can be more fine grain, like SST5 has five classes ranging from negative to positive. Um, whereas say you want to do something like classify whether sentiment about the Vietnam War is hawkish or dovish. Um, you can't rely at all on the article having a positive or a negative tone to do that because hawkish articles can be really positive or really negative depending on what they're talking about and the same thing for dovish articles and they can be talking about a vast number of things you know that fall under the domain of foreign intervention um and i think that this is sort of true more generally you know so i was reading a, a meta review of this literature um and it found like pretty poor performance on 
uh, categorizing news articles as um, uh, pro-life or not. Um, and you'd think that that might be pretty clear and it was better than some other things, but still like, you know, these documents can be talking about a vast number of things and like the sentiment of both sides can be very positive or very negative depending on what they're talking about. Um, and so oftentimes just using, you know, positive negative labels as you do with reviews won't really work. Um, and so what the literature finds does work a little bit better is potentially stance detection. Um, so you ask, do two pieces of text have the same stance? You could treat this as a clustering problem. Um, you know, so essentially a buy encoder or as a Siamese classification problem where you jointly embed um, the two pieces of text into a BERT-like model um, and then classify them as same or different. Um, and so the challenge with this is that um, you really need the two pieces of text to be talking about the same thing and the only difference being that they may have different sentiments on whatever they're talking about um, because obviously if they're talking about different things um, and you're asking if they're the same or different like it's going to be very hard like the, the task just isn't coherent anymore right like if they're talking about different things you know even if their stance comes from the same underlying political view or something that's just like a lot to ask for a classifier um and so in the context of a product review on amazon um you know kind of by definition that they're talking about the same thing um Whereas we found this a lot more challenging in the context of, say, editorials. Um, and it's also kind of a problem we're still working on and we're kind of hopeful um, that ultimately we will have a model um, that is, first of all, able to group articles based in, and editorials based on them being about the same thing and then detect the stance. Um, but that is sort of a challenge. There may be other contexts where more naturally you can be confident um, the two pieces of text are the same thing and that will make it more straightforward um, to be able to say, do these have the same stance? Um, and so that's um, sentiment analysis, stance detection. I know a lot of people are interested in this and I really look forward to talking about it more on Class Tuesday. Thank you.